Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the word Neurocranium. Oh boy, here we go again. What do you mean? You're going to tie that word into either the story or the banter between you and BG. It's true. You really need to settle things with him. What would be the fun in that? Inspector Clark speaking. Yes? The Cooper Rubies, where? Blackstone's at 49th. I'll be right over. Oh, come in, Inspector. Oh, this is terrible, terrible. And to think that we took such precautions. I just can't understand this. Now, now, just a moment, Mr. Blackstone. Just calm down a bit and tell me what's happened. I'll tell you what's happened. One of the Cooper rubies has been stolen. That's what's happened. I understand that, Mr. Blackstone. But if I could have some information about them... Uh, the Cooper rubies are a group of 15 of the most exquisite stones I have ever had in my possession. Uh, this woman, Mrs. Lloyd, came into my shop and asked to see the Cooper rubies. I wanted to buy one, but I certainly don't now. I was showing them to her myself. At the same time, I was showing this gentleman, uh, Mr. Williams, some bracelets. Just a simple little bracelet for my wife, Inspector. I was interrupted by one of the sales girls. I turned away for just a moment, and when I looked back, one of the rubies was gone. Now I ask you, who other than one of these two could have taken it? Your assumption is quite sound, Mr. Blackstone. I'm very much afraid I'm going to have to ask you two to be searched. Why, of all the Leave your bag here on the desk. Mr. Blackstone's secretary will assist you in the other room. Mr. Williams, I'll search you in Mr. Blackstone's office. Now, let's see. Mrs. Lloyd's bag. Compact. Nothing here. Lipstick. No secret compartments. I hope you're satisfied. Gloves. Nothing in the pockets. Well, I guess that eliminates you, Mrs. Lloyd. (laughs) Now, Mr. Williams' things. Nothing in the pockets. Billfold. Home. Does that eliminate me, Inspector? I guess it does, Mr. Williams. Everything seems to be quite in order. Uh, cigarette, Mrs. Lloyd? No, thank you. I don't smoke. Williams? No, thanks. I have my pipe. Oh, of course. Well, Mr. Blackstone, I've found your precious ruby. You've what? Uh, but I haven't seen it. No, you haven't seen it, Mr. Blackstone, but I know where it is. Mr. Williams, I arrest you for the theft of the Cooper ruby. <laughs> How did the inspector discover Eric Williams' theft of the Cooper rubies? Do you know the clue? In a moment, we'll hear more. But first... Oh, 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 I know, I know. You know what? How to be a pinhead. I'm not sure what you mean. Pinhead is a pejorative for someone born with an ancipalli. With what? A severe congenital condition in which a large part of the skull is absent, along with the cerebral hemispheres of the brain. That sounds really bad. It is my best precognitive juxtaposition to date. And you call me an idiot. Yes, I do. I'm insulted. As you should be. And now, let's see what Inspector Clark has to say. But I don't understand. Where is the ruby, Inspector? Well, Mr. Blackstone, when I asked these two people to submit to be searched, I knew the guilty one would hold out. For a moment, I thought I was licked. We seemed to have all their possessions, yet nothing was evident. Only when I offered Mr. Williams a cigarette did I notice that he was smoking a pipe. 
Here, Mr. Blackstone, is your ruby, concealed in the bowl of this pipe. And now, Mr. Williams, I'd like to show you something in bracelets. A double one, better known as the handcuff. Well, what I was going to say is that the ruby was in the pipe. And I still say that you are a numbskull. You sure are fixated on my head. That's not healthy. I would come up with another quick slam, but I doubt I could beat my last one. Well, here's one for you, BG. Your head is so big that you put the moon out of business. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. We have quite the collection of stuff today. Oh, how exciting. Glad you think so. We have a new Q&A with Ron. How pretentious. I think that depends. Then we review the audiobook Wool, read a story sent in by Tanya, and then try to stop an alien invasion. Is there anything else? Why, yes, there is. We're going to end the show with a not-so-important times in history, David Hussick's vision. So grab a drink, and let's get to these questions. Welcome to Q&A with Ron. We get a lot of SMSs, MMSs, RCSs, in-app messages, and good old-fashioned emails. Some good, some not, and some have questions. What I've done is collected a bunch of these, and I'm going to answer them today. Let's get started. This first one comes from Twitter user at RCPlayer533. Some of you may have noticed that I really don't support Twitter anymore. I'm not a hater. I'm just waiting to see how it all turns out. If it does become a full-fledged pay service, I plan to take the hard pass. RC has this question. Ron, you seem to have a lot of insider information on old-time radio. Are you old enough to remember these things, or is it something else? Okay, I'm old, but not quite that old. I became interested in old-time radio in the 80s. At the time, you had to be a collector because there was no internet. I've told that story before. How I became in the know was by research and a gift from my brother. He gave me a book called The Top 100 Classic Radio Shows. It's actually kind of a cyclopedia of the best shows in OTR. I read this thing cover to cover. That led to a second book called The Encyclopedia of Old Time Radio. While I've never read this one cover to cover, I use it a lot to get the info that you hear on the show. I love researching the golden age of radio, and I hope that you guys enjoy the knowledge. This next question comes from Tina Finstad. Tina is a long-time listener, and I want to thank you for hanging around. Tina wants to know, The show has been very formulamatic lately. While I'm not complaining, I do like it when you shake things up a bit. Are you going to be doing something different? Wow, that's a rough question, Tina. Yes, I have been sticking to the show format. A lot has been due to personal issues some due to vacation and some due to illness. There is a flow to the segments that helps me create them a bit easier. A template, if you will. I do, however, create new content and plug it into the various templates that I have created. I try not to do a lot of repeats, but I do occasionally reuse the audible segments. When there is a low in listener stories, which happens every summer, I do reuse them. I try to go back at least a couple years and often give them a fresh coat of paint. 
Sometimes I even contact the person for any updates. Will I be doing something different? I'm always thinking about that. I'm planning some new segments, and like I said last week, I'm working on a history of the podcast segment to celebrate our 12th year. So hang in there, and I hope that you continue to enjoy the show. I get this question a lot. How can I help the show? The latest version of this came from Dennis Fracture, who lives in Chicago. Ron, I want to do something. I want to learn something and help the show. Okay, I'm probably adding a little drama there, but you get the idea. I do say this at the end of every show. If you want to help, the best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it. Hit the like button and please leave reviews. The reviews are the best. If you want to do something more, you can go to the main website and give me a story to read on the show. Heck, if you want to come on the show and tell your story, that would be even better. There is a donate button on the main website if you want to help with the costs. I am looking to upgrade the main computer here in the next year or so. If you want to do more, let's talk. Send me an email and we can work out a time for a chat. There you have it. Another Q&A with Ron. If you want to send me a question, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com and click on the contact tab. I do answer every email I get. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? Wool, The Silo Saga, Book 1, by Hugh Howey. If you have an Apple TV subscription, you're probably familiar with this one. I watched the series and was completely taken in by it. It is an incredibly original story and deep with plausible characters and ideas. There is so much mystery surrounding this story that I couldn't just sit around and wait for season two to find out more. I knew that it had to be based on something and it didn't take long to find its source. Silo is a series of post-apocalyptic science fiction books by Hugh Howey. The series started in 2011 with the short story Wool, which was later published together with four sequels. Along with Wool, the series consists of Shift, Dust, three short stories, and Wool, the graphic novel. The series has also been adapted as a comic book, and as I mentioned, an Apple TV Plus television series. I wasn't too surprised to find that it had an extensive fanfiction following. This audiobook is the story of mankind clawing for survival. The world outside has grown toxic, the view of it limited, talk of it forbidden. The remnants of humanity live underground in a single silo. But there are always those who hope and dream. These are the dangerous people, the residents who infect others with their optimism. Their punishment is simple. They are given the very thing they want. They are allowed to go outside. Here is an edited clip from the beginning of the book and it introduces the sheriff. The children were playing while Holston climbed 
He could hear them squealing, as only happy children do. While they thundered about frantically above, Holston took his time, each step methodical and ponderous, as he wound his way around and around the spiral staircase, old boots ringing out on metal treads. The treads, like his father's boots, showed signs of wear. Paint clung to them in feeble chips, mostly in the corners and undersides, where they were safe. Traffic elsewhere on the staircase sent dust shivering off in small clouds. Holston could feel the vibrations in the railing, which was worn down to the gleaming metal. That always amazed him, how centuries of bare palms and shuffling feet could wear down solid steel, one molecule at a time, he supposed. Each life might wear away a single layer, even as the silo wore away that life. Each step was slightly bowed from generations of traffic, the edge rounded down like a pouting lip. In the center there was almost no trace of the small diamonds that once gave the treads their grip. Their absence could only be inferred from the pattern to either side, the small pyramidal bumps rising from the flat steel with their crisp edges and flecks of paint. Holston lifted an old boot to an old step, pressed down, and did it again. And he thought, not for the first time, that neither life nor staircase had been meant for such an existence. The tight confines of that long spiral, threading through the buried silo like a straw in a glass, had not been built for such abuse. Like much of their cylindrical home, it seemed to have been made for other purposes, for functions long since forgotten. What was now used as a thoroughfare for thousands of people, moving up and down in repetitious daily cycles, seemed more apt in Holston's view to be used only in emergencies. Another floor went by, a pie-shaped division of dormitories. As Holston ascended the last few levels, the sounds of childlike delight rained down even louder from above. This was the laughter of youth, of souls who had not yet come to grips with where they lived, who did not yet feel the press of the earth on all sides, who in their minds were not buried at all, but alive, alive and unworn, dripping happy sounds down the stairwell, trills that were incongruous with Holston's actions, his decision and determination to go outside. As he neared the upper level, one young voice rang out above the others, and Holston remembered being a child in the silo all the schooling and the games. Back then the stuffy concrete cylinder had felt, with its floors and floors of apartments and workshops and hydroponic gardens and purification rooms with their tangles of pipes, like a vast universe, a wide expanse one could never fully explore, a labyrinth he and his friends could get lost in forever. But those days were more than thirty years distant. He had an entire lifetime as sheriff, weighing heavy, blocking off that past. At the top of the spiral stairway, Holston's hand ran out of railing. The curvy bar of worn steel ended as the stairwell emptied into the widest rooms of the entire silo complex, the cafeteria and the adjoining lounge. He looked past the adults and playing children to the blurry view beyond, projected on the cafeteria wall. It was the largest uninterrupted vista of their inhospitable world. A morning scene. Dawn's dim light coated lifeless hills that had hardly changed since Holston was a boy. They sat, just as they always had, while he had gone from playing chase among the cafeteria tables to whatever empty thing he was now. And beyond the stately rolling crest of these hills, the top of a familiar and rotting skyline caught the morning rays in feeble glints. Ancient glass and steel stood distantly where people, it was suspected, had once lived above ground. Holston turned away from the games and the blurry view and walked toward his office, situated between the cafeteria and the silo's airlock, and entered his office. Well, look who's up early, Martin said, smiling. Holston's deputy closed a metal drawer on the filing cabinet, a lifeless cry singing from its ancient joints. He picked up a steaming mug, then noted Holston's solemn demeanor. Are you feeling okay, boss? Holston nodded. He pointed to the rack of keys behind the desk. Holding cell, he said. The deputy's smile drooped into a confused frown. He set down the mug and turned to retrieve the key. While his back was turned, Holston rubbed the sharp, cool steel in his palm one last time, then placed the star flat on the desk. Marnes turned and held out the key. Holston took it. He turned, the chair behind the desk squeaking as Marnes rose to join him. 
and Holston completed his march. The key slid in with ease. There was a sharp clack from the well-built and well-maintained inner organs of the door. Boss? Holston held the key between the bars. Marnes looked down at it, unsure, but his palm came up to accept it. What's going on, boss? Get the mayor, Holston said. He let out a sigh, that heavy breath he'd been holding for three years. Tell her I want to go outside. There is so much to this story, and I only played that clip to give you an idea of the quality of it and the skill of its narrator, whose name I won't even try to pronounce. We'll just call him Ed. Ed is fantastic, and he brings to life the characters and the silo itself. Truly an amazing job. I plan to get the other three books in the series and learn the secrets of the silo and perhaps the fate of our world. I highly recommend this audiobook and the series playing on Apple TV+. If you want to hear the silo saga, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and you can have it for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out the service. This also grants you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly, and I do mean constantly, with new titles. So, to download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. You'll not only get a great tale, but you'll also help out the podcast. Thank you, Audible. And now it's time for a few of your classic stories. These are your stories sent by you for you. This week we have a story from Tanya Woodall, who lives in Tucson, Arizona. Tanya didn't want to write her story herself, so we hashed it out over a phone call. We have titled this one, The Haunting at Antique Mall. Do ghosts come out of the past? Most people think so. Well then, what more appropriate place than an antique mall? Tanya says that in Tucson we have such a place at the 22nd Street Antique Mall. She should know she's worked there the last 10 years. Here are her stories. The mall has a main store and two-story annex. It was originally built as a furniture store with an office on the second floor of the annex. That area is now a mini-museum of sorts. In one corner, an antique typewriter was placed on a 19th century ornate desk. Several customers and employees report hearing that typewriter typing away. But when it's investigated, there's nobody there. The museum mostly contains furniture, chairs, desks, tables, beds, etc. Each morning, the employees straighten up the furniture before opening. Why? because during the night it all gets rearranged. The chairs are pulled out into the aisles and lamps are placed on the floor. No explanation has ever been found for this, and ghost hunters who have stayed the night have seen absolutely no activity. One afternoon, Tanya was working on a new arrival in the room. She had a radio playing to pass the time. During the day, the volume had increased suddenly. She'd have to walk over and turn it back down. Finally, she got tired of the fun and yelled, Stop messing with the radio! After that, it never acted up again. During one Christmas holiday season, the shop was very busy. Tanya and a customer were approaching the doorway into the annex, and both were suddenly frozen in place. The people who were shopping all sped up like in a time warp. It might have only been a few seconds, but it seemed like hours to them. Then everything slowed back down to a normal pace. Tanya said, 
We both just stood there for several minutes with dazed look on our faces. Tanya finally turned to the customer and said, Did you see that? The customer replied, What just happened? One event grabbed the attention of everyone in the store when they heard the loud sound of crashing glass from one of the front booths. They all rushed to the booth, but nothing was amiss. The booth was rented to a dealer who had died a month before. His goods were still there, but he was not. People who knew the man called him the prankster. Perhaps these stories are all imagination. But Tanya and anyone else who spends time at the 22nd Street Antique Mall is sure that the place is haunted. Tanya Woodall, Tucson, Arizona. Well, I have to say I had a great time talking with Tanya, and after doing so, I'm 100% convinced that she's right. That place surely must be haunted. Thank you for your story, Tanya. It truly is amazing. Our featured story comes from the OTR radio series 2000 Plus that ran on the mutual broadcasting system from 1950 to 1952. It was the first adult-oriented science fiction series on radio, airing one month prior to the better-known Dimension X. Sherman Dreyer scripted and produced the series with main cast members Lon Clark, Henry Norell, Bill Keane, and Brianna Rayburn. The story we're going to hear today is titled The Rocket and the Skull. Has the Earth already been invaded by Martians? And if so, what's their plan now? This one first aired on October 10th, 1950. 2000 Plus. Science fiction adventures from the world of tomorrow, the years beyond 2000 A.D. 2000 Plus presents The Rocket and the Skull. Have you heard from Colonel Bradbury yet? No, sir. I've been trying to for ten minutes. We'll try again. Yes, sir. B for base to R for rocket. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. Every time Bradbury's more than five minutes late, I get the jitters. He's too important for this project not to know where he is every moment. Yes, sir. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. Try a scanner beam. He should be on the all-clear level out of Detroit. Yes, sir. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. We can't afford to have anything happen to him. The first experiment is being conducted tomorrow morning. Bradbury is the only man who knows every step of the routine. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. You're not getting him. Cut the scanner and return to standard beam. Yes, sir. Come in, R for rocket. He should have left an hour earlier. And he could have taken a scheduled flight. But no, he has to work up to the last minute and then fly his own plane to get here in time. B for base to R for rocket. R for rocket. B for base. This is R for rocket. Oh, there he is, sir. Beam contact at 14 over 6. He's about 80 miles out of Detroit. Give me that mic. Brad, this is General Hilton. Are you receiving me? Go ahead, General. What happened? We couldn't contact you. I had some trouble with my stabilizer. Thought I might have to land. But it's okay now. Are you sure? We can't have anything happen to you. Don't worry, sir. The first experiment is being conducted tomorrow morning. Everything is ready for you. Good. The entire general staff will be there. Maybe the president himself. Is there anything you want me to have done before you come in? Brad. Anything you want done. Hello, R for rocket. I'm not getting a response. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. I 
Well, he was receiving clears a bell. Come in, R for rocket. He said the stabilizer had been acting up. That can mean a lot of trouble at 700 miles an hour. What's that? Automatic distress signal, sir. Coming from Colonel Bradbury's plane. Hello, Crash Central. This is V for base. Automatic distress signal coming in on channel 420. Colonel Bradbury flying a rocket jet X-93. Take. Hey, it's stuck. V for base to Crash Central. Automatic signal cease to register at beam contact 16 over 8. Carry out emergency crash procedures. Repeat. Colonel Bradbury's rocket jet X-93 has crashed on beam position 16 over 8. Check out. I'm glad you were able to get here, General. We're going to operate very shortly. No, sir, it's a miracle he's alive. It will be more of a miracle if he's alive one hour from now. You've got to save him. He's an important man. Yes, the White House called and so did the Pentagon. We know Colonel Bradbury is important, but a shattered skull is very difficult. I know you'll do all you can. Stay right here, General. We'll keep you informed. Well, it's out of our hands. I have a report from Crash Central, sir. Well? Apparently, Colonel Bradbury used the catapult parachute just before the plane crashed. Otherwise, he would have been killed instantly. When he was catapulted up, his chute didn't open. He fell into a group of trees. Poor Brad. It might have been better if he'd stayed in the ship. You heard what the doctor said? Yes, sir. A shattered skull. The one brain we need to carry out the experiment tomorrow, and this is what had us. So. Plan. Son. Scalpel. Not my brown earth. Plan. Systolic. 80 over 40. The patient thinking, sir. More oxygen. Yes, sir. Patient responding, sir. Good. Careful. Done. Plan. I'm completely out, Lieutenant. Have you a cigarette? Yes, sir. Here you are. Thanks. Oh, this waiting. Waiting. It's been more than an hour. Brain surgery is very delicate, sir. May take another hour. Or even more. You carried out my orders to postpone the experiment? Yes, sir, until further notice. If Brad doesn't live, we'll have to start another man all over. May set the project back a year, and the year could be dangerous. Oh, you look surprised, Lieutenant. You don't know what this experiment's all about, do you? Well, I see the code name for it on the paper, sir, but it never has a description. After all, it's marked top secret. Maybe it's about time you were told with Brad upstairs hanging on to life by a thread. I'm going to need a bright young man to give me some important assistance. You've come through with pretty good colors these last many hours. Thank you, sir. Well, we'll talk more about it in a little while. Right now, I'm going to stretch out and try to rest. I'm about done in. If I hear anything, I'll awaken you, sir. I don't expect I'll sleep. Not with the fate of the world depending on a surgeon's knife upstairs in the operating room. Sam. Sam. Adjust the light, miss. Scalpel. Probe. Yes. Quite a bone fragment. Sponge. Slam. Systolic. 70 over 40. Oxygen again. It's pure oxygen now, sir. Nurse. Prepare for transfusion. 60 over 40. Patient thinking, sir. Well, that's right, nurse. And go ahead, Dr. Bowen. Hurry. Condition same, doctor. He's getting the transfusion. And let me help you, Dr. Bowen. There. Well? Systolic. 80 over 40. Good. He's responding. All right. Careful. Probe. Slam. Just too nervous even to rest. How long has it been? Almost two hours, sir. Two hours. Just about now the general staff would be arriving and Brad would be checking everything for the experiment in the morning. Lieutenant, have you any guess about that experiment, about what it is? Well, I... My guess is it, it's about a new kind of aircraft. Oh, why do you say that? Well, just because it's an Air Force project. Well, I wouldn't say you were warm, but you aren't cold either. The experiment and the reason it's so important concerns a rocket to the moon. A rocket to the moon? But 
But why, sir? Why send one there? Who controls the moon controls the world. If we had rockets on the moon, we could compel peace on Earth. The United Nations would press a button and wipe any aggressor off the face of the Earth. But that means space travel. You don't mean that we... No, Lieutenant, we haven't found the way to send rocket ships with human beings through space. Not yet, anyway. But the rocket we're experimenting with is a two-way rocket. It can land on the moon and return from the moon, all electronically controlled from the Earth. Sounds fantastic, sir. Oh, it's quite feasible, I assure you. But we have reason to believe that we're not the only nation thinking of this. Time is of the essence. Colonel Bradbury knows more about operating these rockets than any man alive. And just on the verge of the experiment, this has to happen. Quiet. General Hilton. Yes? Uh, Dr. Rizzo asked me to take a message down to you from the operating room. Brad. He's dead, isn't he? Uh, No, General. He's still hanging on. Dr. Rizzo says that he now has a 30% chance of surviving. Thank God. Part of Colonel Bradbury's skull has been fragmented. A head plate will have to be put on. Because of the size of the area, a new metal alloy plate will be used. It'll take at least five or six more hours. Dr. Riggio suggests you go home, General, where you'll be more comfortable. The hospital will phone you if anything happens. Bradbury, can you hear me? Uh, this is Dr. Riggio. Uh, Nurse, open the blinds a little. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Now, ease his back with the pillow. I'll hold him. Uh, uh, fine, thank you. Uh, ten days since the operation, and he's just now coming out of it. He's a strong man. Almost any other person would have died. Colonel Bradbury. Mm-hmm. Colonel Bradbury, can you hear me? The the base rocket. Our rocket. He's beginning to talk. (laughs) Nurse, have Dr. Keyes come in at once. Take license off. Our rocket. (laughs) General. Wrong. It's all right, Colonel. Take it easy. (laughs) You call for me. The nurse said he was coming out of it. He's talking erratically. Typical stuff. Uh, Rocket base. And that sort of thing. Well, it's technical jargon. Air Force lingo. No. Mars. Martians. Mars? Uh, uh, Martian? They use all sorts of code names. Mars is probably one of them. I think in about 48 hours, he ought to be out of shock completely. We can call General Hilton. Tell him to come over day after tomorrow. Uh, 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 take it easy, Colonel. Six months, and you ought to be in pretty good shape. Nurse, keep him comfortable. Dr. Keyes and I will leave now. Uh, rock. Stabilizer off. Wrong. Something wrong. <laughs> Must call General. Call General Hilton. Mars. M- Martian. Mars. <laughs> Read that back to me, please. Memorandum to General Staff. One, the new experiment is tentatively planned for April 3rd, 2000 plus 6. Two, all security measures have been taken. Three, although severely handicapped by Colonel Bradbury's absence, newly trained specialists will endeavor to fill the gap. Anything more, General? No, no, Lieutenant. Uh... (laughs) Sorry, I should say no, Captain. You like that extra bar? I certainly do, sir. Well, you've earned it, Bob. You've been a great help to me. Okay, note the memo is top secret and send it facsimile to the Pentagon. Oh, I'll take it. Never mind. General Hilton. Who? The President. Oh, yes, Mr. President. Of course, sir. Well, I've just prepared a memorandum, but that's only two weeks, Mr. President. We assumed about 60 days. Oh. Yes, sir. We'll work day and night to do it. Now, thank you, Mr. President. Captain, change the date in the first paragraph of the memo. The new experiment is to take place in two weeks. General, that's almost impossible. I know it, and you know it. But there's one man who doesn't know it, and he says it's got to be done. <laughs> I'm not disposed to argue with the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'd like to double-check some of my notes on Colonel Bradbury with you. Of course, Doctor. Well, this afternoon, the general's coming to see him. But uh, Colonel Bradbury needs months of convalescence. And he's not too lucid. Now, that's the point. He's not too lucid, but weak as he is, he talks normally for a while. Makes sense. And then that strange reaction sets in. I've observed it myself three times. Well, head injury cases are quite unpredictable. Yeah, perhaps, but according to my notes, Colonel Bradbury's strange reaction has taken place always either at 10 a.m. or 5 p.m. Of the three instances I've observed, two have been at 10, one at 5. Mm, well, that is unusual. And in each instance, well, I can see him now in my mind's eye. He's sitting or lying in bed, talking quite sensibly, although in a weak, weak voice, suddenly he becomes tense. He grimaces as if his head were in pain. He even clutches the bedclothes with tight fists. He appears to be rigid. Mm. Then, after a few minutes, invariably comes a flood of disjoint, the disconnected sentences about messages, emergency, crisis, fate of the world, and Mars. Our General Hilton is going to visit the Colonel this afternoon at about five o'clock. And you expect the Colonel to have another strange reaction? I don't know. Well, surely General Hilton realizes that a man who's had severe surgery can't... I be... can't tell what the General will realize, but... My fear is that he may feel the colonel is not improving as well as he might, and he may call in other doctors. But we're doing everything humanly possible. That is the irony of the situation. I could have killed the colonel in surgery. It would have been very easy. But where important government officials are concerned, I get worried. If we ever were investigated carefully, they might find out who you and I really are. And that would be dangerous. Very dangerous, indeed. In here? Thank you, nurse. Hello, Brad. Hello, General. I understand you wanted to see me. I came as soon as I could. And... Sit. Sit down. Sure, Brad. Don't worry about me. Brad, we're rescheduling the experiment. Do you feel up to answering a few questions about it? Experiment? Something to tell you. Sure, Brad. Sure, I know there's a lot you want to tell me, but well, you're still a sick guy, so... Suppose I just ask you a few questions and you answer them yes or no. That'll save your energy. Time. What time is it? Why, it's a few seconds before five o'clock. Why? Coming. Message coming. Message coming? What message? Trying to tell you. Couldn't tell anyone else. Mars. Martians. Mars. Martians. Trying to tell me what? <laughs> Brad. For heaven's sake. <laughs> What's the matter, Brad? <laughs> Nurse. A doctor. Something's happening to Colonel Bradbury. Hurry. Hurry. <laughs> Colonel. Colonel. Dr. Riggio, can you hear me? Mars. Mars. General Hilton is here, too. You remember? And, sorry, General, strange things happen to the human mind. His skull is a metal plate. Mars. Calling Mars. Earth. Message. It's like a fit. <laughs> Look at him. Agent reporting. Urgent. <laughs> Calling Mars. You are received. Mars receiving your call. Proceed. Anna Bradbury. Colonel. The nurse will try a hypo. Get one for me, please. Uh, 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 oh. Earth to moon experiment will take place in 12 Earth days. Spell him. Individual Colonel Bradbury will be Thank you, nurse. Now I'll inject. There. You should relax in a moment. Very incapacitated. Yes. Government this order experiment to proceed. Here are your further orders. The experiment must fail. No. No. You are to be certain of all steps are taken. There. Hypo has released his tension. He'll sleep now. He'll be all right when he awakens. Yes, but what happened to him, doctor? I'm not certain, General, but... 
In a few days, we may be able to tell more. I know you're doing everything possible, Doctor, and we're grateful for your saving Brad's life. But mightn't it be wise to call in some specialists, some other doctors for consultation? There's so much information and advice we need from Colonel Bradbury. Call in other doctors? Well, General, I don't know that that's necessary. It's so strange watching him, almost as if he were listening to something. You know, now that I think of it, he did say something about a message. Do you think there's any connection? I hardly think so, General. After all, we didn't hear anything. No, no. I'm afraid it was just the erratic talk of a sick and injured brain. General, you really went through an experience watching the colonel like that. Captain, he was almost in a fit. Had some crazy idea he was getting messages. Messages? Just hallucinations. He was off his rocker for a while. I'm afraid I was a little brusque with Dr. Reggio. He's a fine man, but I'd feel better if some other medicos looked at Brad, too. Arrange for some specialist from Army Medical to examine him, will you, Captain? Yes, sir. I'll do it promptly. And one thing more. On the experiment file, you'll find it. A... General Hilton's office. Uh, one moment, please. For you, sir. Pentagon, intelligence section. Intelligence? Well. Hello. General Hilton. Yes. Yes. Are you certain? Well, have the president and the chief of staff been informed? Good. Yes, I'll be over in 15 minutes. Right. Order my car, Captain. Things are happening. Yes, sir. General Hilton's car stand by at west entrance. What thing, sir? Intelligence reports that the Eastern Alliance is definitely planning a moon rocket for blastoff in six days. You know what that means if they get there before the United Nations. Six days, and we won't be ready for 14 days. We really wanted three months. That's right. But how... Somehow they must have found out about our experiment and have agents that feed for some of our vital data. That's what the emergency meeting is about. Well, your car's ready, General. Good luck. We're going to need it, Captain. We're going to need it. Keys. Dr. Keys. Have you heard? What is it? Some other doctors are examining Colonel Bradbury. Yes, I just missed them. What? Uh, of course, I gave them permission. I had no choice. General Hilton requested it yesterday. Or rather, that's just it. Army medical. Army. How you can be so cold and calculating in surgery and so nervous now, I cannot understand. Your record here is flawless. Your operation on Bradbury is superb. No suspicion will attach to you or to me. If we conduct ourselves in a normal and professional manner, what is the risk? But they are the army. Now, that means an intelligence section. They have routines about these things. We have no choice but to keep up appearances. I know, I know. But if they ever find out that we are the agents of the Eastern Alliance, that we have masterminded the theft of certain moon rocket data... They will be ruthless, Dr. Keyes. Ruthless. General Hilton's office. Oh, I'm sorry, the general isn't here. This is his aide. No, sir, I, I don't know when he'll return. I suggest you place the information on our private facsimile line in code. Our extension is 83. I'll then give the papers to the general when he arrives. Yes, sir. I'll turn the facsimile line on now, sir. We can receive it at once. Thank you. Ah, coming in now. A report regarding Colonel Bradbury. Item one. Good heavens, Dr. Reggio. Item two. A metal plate surgically applied to Colonel Bradbury's skull. A metal skull plate. Martian voices. So that's what the Colonel's hallucinations are. It's fantastic. There, the message is ended. We must move quickly. Very quickly. Military police. Hello, General Hilton's office. 
At Central Hospital, there are two staff doctors, Dr. Rijo and Dr. Keyes. Right. Place them under arrest at once. Hello? Message headquarters, please. This is General Hilton's aide. When the general returns, tell him I'll be at Central Hospital talking to Colonel Bradbury. I'm the general's aide. You can describe the voices to me. Now, what happened? My, my whole head vibrates. Very painful. Then I hear voices. What are they saying? They're talking to Mars. Martians. Martians. Well, apparently the metal plate on your head somehow picks up certain high-frequency radio waves. At least that's the theory of the Army Medical Experiment. But, but the Martian, they want to stop the moon rocket. Enemies from another world. No, Colonel, you can't really believe that. You, you must have misunderstood. The real enemies are the Eastern Alliance. But their agents have been caught. Their moon project won't take place for a long time as a result. Now, you just take it easy, sir. But, the Army is going to track down that wavelength that bothers your head. Then you'll recuperate peacefully. But, Captain, true. Excuse me, sir. It's almost five o'clock. I've, I've got to be going, sir. Just take it easy, please. to Mars on the regular wavelength at 5 o'clock. Hereafter, use the alternate wavelength. I will submit a report explaining how our communications were discovered. But you can report this. The Eastern Alliance agents have been captured by the Americans. This reduces the chances of the Earth sending a moon rocket from two to only one. I will see to it that that one does not succeed. Are you positive you can execute this plan? Without question. Go on. You may report to my superiors on Mars that their observation base on the moon is safe from discovery. Mars will continue to be the only planet controlling outer space. That is all. It shall be reported. Captain, I just read that facsimile message in my office. Came as quickly as I could. Now, what on earth is happening? Why, nothing on Earth is happening, General. What are you talking about? Well, I mean, everything's all right now, sir, isn't it? The Eastern Alliance has been taken care of, and there's reason to believe Colonel Bradbury's weird hallucinations won't recur anymore. Oh, those are the two best pieces of news I've heard all day. Captain, I don't know what I'd do without you. Thank you, sir. I just try to do the best I can for my country. <laughs> Great story, and a bit of a warning to us all. Have aliens already taken over the Earth? And are they here now, protecting the universe by making sure that humans stay right here? It's something to think about. Our story was adapted for radio by Sherman Dreyer. It came from the pages of IF magazine and an editor's expose on this very subject. His thoughts were on the recent increase of UFO activity. Flying saucers were all the rage, and he postulated that these vehicles were actually a police-keeping force, here to keep the Earth safe from unwanted visitors. Not too crazy, I think. I hope that you enjoyed today's story. I know I had some fun with it.
not so important times in history. In this segment, we take a look at historical events that may otherwise go unnoticed. We look at history with a fish-eyed lens, giving a perspective that should provide no insight to anyone or any time. But it is historical, or hysterical, as the case may be. Join us now for this event in history. In 1801, on 20 acres of Manhattan farmland, a doctor founded the first botanical garden in the United States. David Hossack's vision was for a medical and agricultural research facility that would nurture his young nation. He amassed a collection of more than 3,000 native and non-native species of plants. Among those who contributed were Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson two pretty famous guys. Hussack used his garden to conduct some of the earliest scientific plant research in the United States and helped bring into being the first generation of professional American botanists. At the time of his death, Hussack was famous in the United States and Europe, in part for his civic work and for his role as the attending physician at an 1804 duel to the death, which was legal at the time. Who was involved? Two of his friends, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. And we all know how that one turned out. In 1814, Columbia University acquired Hossack's land from the state of New York. They eventually leased the land to John D. Rockefeller Jr., who built the Rockefeller Center on the site. I doubt few know that that land was once a garden. Today, there are botanical gardens conducting environmental research and education in every state, continuing the work that Hossack started. How about that? Tuesday Jack, the foaming cleanser. Clean pots and pans, just like the whiz. Ajax cuts grease faster than any other leading cleanser. Do some pain, the elbow packs, when you start cleaning with Ajax. Ajax really polishes as it cleans. So use Ajax, the foaming cleanser. Bump the dirt, right down the drain. My gosh, they're right. Homing action Ajax makes even the dirtiest pan shine like new in a jiffy. So use Ajax! Well, that was episode number 601, and we had some stuff. I want to thank everyone that sent questions in, and to Tanya Woodall, I thank you for your story. It was really good. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.